our special preacher guest today is a alum of The Way and UC Berkeley. Uh, I'm super grateful uh, that God has blessed us to be able to have Minister Ryan uh, back here with us at The Way. I remember, I'm not going to read your bio because I'm just going to tell a story. But I remember when uh, we first met uh, Ryan, I, we were having a Bible study. I, I don't think she remembers this. It was a Wednesday night. And uh, she came and she sat right there on the side and she just was in a place of just, you know, from her own profession, like just in a really tough season. And I think she got invited maybe by... Maybe I ain't gonna name drop because I don't want to be lying up here before we bring up the preacher. But uh, a friend, I think, brought uh, uh, Ryan here, and Ryan was uh, here working on a journalism degree at Cal. And Ryan was deeply immersed in the movement for Black Lives at the time, and was so moved by everything that was happening. Launched her own apparel company that was called Gloss Rags. And some of y'all probably wore her shirts and didn't even know it was her shirts. Shirts that had the names of loved ones who were taken by police and state violence. And Ryan was uh, just here making it all happen, making it all come together. And uh, she got uh, the bug. She got called. She felt the call to go into full-time ministry and and uh, graduated from Cal with her journalism degree, won an Emmy, I think, on the way, and, uh, and, 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 and has just done all kind of wonderful, wonderful uh, things. Finished at Yale Divinity School, and now has a Master's of Theology, Divinity, amen, amen. I don't want to shortchange somebody say amen. And uh, started her own ministry called Salt and Light Ministries which uh, I'm sure she will tell you a lot about. Uh, we've been uh, certainly staying in touch and relationship. We intended to have Minister Ryan come preach last year, but our schedules around spring break and things didn't work out and she was finishing her seminary degree. And so I think she made the right decision to stay and finish and not be flying across country trying to preach. Somebody say man, Because as we stated that you'll have the rest of your life to preach, but you only have a little bit of time to get straight A's at Yale. Somebody say amen. Or whatever your grades was, amen. But you know. But more than anything, I'm appreciative of Ryan's story. She has been very bold and public about her journey uh, with her own kind of sense of uh, being related to bodily autonomy and women's reproductive health and just how we as the church need to show up and be much more uh, affirming, embracing, and present for our community members and loved ones as they make these journeys and these transitions in their life. And so I'm super excited to have uh, Minister Ryan here. Following service, we're going to have a special chat and chew opportunity to hang out with Minister Ryan. We'll bring a couple chairs on stage after we give her a chance, maybe 10 minutes just to kind of catch your breath and we're going to talk a little bit about her journey her sermon and a special project that she's launching in partnership with the way and a few congregations over the summer and so i would love for all of you who are able and willing to please hang out for about 45 minutes or so after church and let's just get a chance to have a conversation with uh, minister ryan and and uh, she'll be back sometime in the early summer and we'll have an opportunity for some weeks to do a collective project together as the church to be more responsive to our loved ones who are dealing with all kind of transitions in life and 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 uh, make sure that we're learning how to show up better for one another. It is indeed the case. I'm convinced that in a world where fragmentation seems to be uh, much more easier than uh, alignment and unity that we have to learn how to show up for each other better. Amen. And uh, I found that you don't have to always agree with everyone or their choices to show up and acknowledge people's humanity and see the God in them and uh, prayerfully be present for them because there's something you may get to learn along the way as well. And so I'm excited to get a chance to let uh, the ministry of Ryan uh, bless us all in the name of the Lord. So let's stand to our feet as we prepare to bring to the pulpit, the spokeswoman for the King of Glory, Minister Ryan Lindsay Arundel. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. 
I am glad to be in the house this morning. You may have your seat. Um, I bring greetings from Double Love Experience Church in Brooklyn, New York, pastors, Reverend Doctors, Gabby and Andrew Cujo Wilkes. And I just am so grateful. It's good to be home. It's good to be home. I want to take um, a little pastoral privilege by the leading of the Holy Spirit and just ask Lauren if you could maybe just sing the chorus to um, Source of Light. We're going to take it back. We're going to take it back. You, you really are taking it back. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I preface this with, so I was in, a, in Philly or outside of Philly for a ministry conference. And on Thursday night, we got news that there was a shooting at a, um, an Eid celebration. Ramadan concluded on Thursday night, and there was a shooting that happened. Um, and then just that weekend, three others were killed in Philadelphia, uh, there were 30 shots that rang out at that Ramadan celebration. And then in D.C., my hometown, there were nine people shot in less than five hours on Friday. And I'm sure there are some numbers here in the Bay Area of shootings. And we think about our sisters and brothers uh, in Gaza, um, far too many to count. And I'm, my heart is heavy with this news. And we are calling for a ceasefire. And, and it, it is seemingly falling on deaf ears of our local and regional officials, our state and national officials. But I just want to have a, a, a brief time of meditation. Um, so if you want to maybe just bow your heads, whatever posture is comfortable for you, maybe it's standing and pacing the room, whatever it is. But uh, Lauren, if you would just bless us for a couple minutes with that as we meditate on those who are hurting and, and, and as we call out for a ceasefire. Ashe. It can be a dark world sometimes. Don't be afraid to be a source of light. Cause it can be a dark world sometimes. Don't be afraid to be a source of light. It can be a dark world sometimes. Don't be afraid to be a source of light. Cause it can be a dark world sometimes Don't be afraid to be a source of light Cause there are times when you need someone And I will be by your side yeah. And there is a light that shines special for you and me. There are times when you need someone and I will be by your side. Yes, I will. And there is a light that shines special, special for you. Cause it can be a dark world sometimes Don't be afraid to be a source of light Sing it with me, say It can be a dark world sometimes Don't be afraid to be a source of One more time, one more time It can be a dark world sometimes God, our source of light, our light bearer, we thank you that your word says, even the darkness is not dark to you. God, so we ask for your light to flood the darkest of places where hope and, dis and despair are constantly at war, God. We ask that you flood the places where darkness seems to have the victory, God, but we thank you, God, that you have the final say. Help us, oh God, in every door, in every classroom, and in every office, every bathroom, every pulpit, every stage, oh God, every space, every grocery store, every aisle, God, every jail cell that we walk into, Father, that we are light, that we be light, oh God, and that we remember when our own light, our flame is growing dim, God, that there are people around us to, to protect and guard our flames, oh God, that you keep us, you keep our flames from going out. We thank you that you are the great keeper. We thank you that you are our light, Lord. So in this moment, God, <clears throat> 
I ask, oh God, that you empty me of myself and fill me with your presence. I thank you for this house of light, the source of light right here in Berkeley, oh God. Bless them, keep them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So I have a text. It's not going to be on the screen, but you'll catch it when I get there. Say amen. amen. All right. <laughs> Hope is a song in a weary throat. Hope is a song in a weary throat. Hope is a song in a weary throat. Reverend Dr. Polly Murray wrote these words in a poem that she penned in 1970. She at Yale University, where I had the honor of studying, is the first and only black person that their residential colleges, their fancy schmancy dorms, are named after. But long before she made history, even post past her life in 2016, Polly was making history on other campuses. After being denied entry from Harvard's law school, Polly went on to be the first woman to graduate from Howard University's law school. The first black person to graduate with a doctorate of law from Yale University. And at Brandeis, she became the first person, female or not, to teach African American studies and women's studies. She is also the first black woman to become an ordained priest in the Episcopal Church. Polly Murray was proudly and openly queer. And the thing is, Polly had a lot to say. Even her essay titles like, Why Negro Girls Stay Single, Negroes Are Fed Up, and, and The Riots Came, speak truth to the truth that Polly Murray used her voice, however she could. And some of the, what she said is sitting in a library that we have called the Mighty Key at Yale, including uh, letters that she wrote to her friend, a poet by the name of Langston Hughes. If you ever come to New Haven, give me a shout and we'll, we'll check it out in the library. But she wrote this poem saying, hope is a song in a weary throat. Give me a song of hope in a world where I can sing it. Give me a song of faith in people to believe it. When is the last time you cried out to God? And what is the song that emerges from your weary throat? And more importantly, do you believe it? I must confess, I know that Easter was about two Sundays ago, but I'm still stuck on Good Friday. On Good Friday, I attended not one, but four services. And if you know anything about the black church tradition, you know that Good Friday services typically feature not one, but seven preachers. Seventh, amen. Uh, and the service, which could be at the very least one hour, but often at least two, maybe three hours. And in these services, you hear seven preachers exegete the seven last sayings of cross, which are as follows. Number one, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Number two, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Number three, woman, behold thy son. Number four, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Number five, I thirst. Number six, it is finished. And number seven, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. As I heard these seven last sayings preached over and over and over on Good Friday in four different services in four different black Baptist churches by at least 14, dare I say, 21 different preachers, I began to think about if, these, if this was a song of hope in Jesus' weary throat. If Jesus, Mary, and Joseph's boy, son of man, God's in flesh martyr, Emmanuel, if Jesus found himself croaking out a song from his weary throat upon that old rugged cross, vocal cords strained not from shouting but strained from silence of having to keep calm and carry his cross on, strained from wanting to shout back at Pontius Pilate and the crowd calling out Barabbas, Barabbas, strained from holding his tongue too many times than he could count in the presence of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Could it be that the seven last sayings Christ uttered indeed were the lyrics to a song in our Savior's weary throat? Could it be that though Jesus was a carpenter, he was also moonlighting as a blues singer who sang only songs that those paying close enough attention could hear? Could the notes of our Messiah been slipping out of his lips as the blood drained from his bodies while hanging on the cross? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Woman, behold thy son. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I thirst. It is finished. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Yes. The lyrics of prophet Marvin Gaye come to mind. Yes. Whoa, mercy, mercy me. Yes. Things ain't what they used to be. Where did all the blue skies go? 
poison is in the wind that blows from the so north and south and east. Whoa, mercy, mercy me, things ain't what they used to be. Oil wasted on the ocean and upon our seas, fish full of mercury. Oh, Jesus, mercy, mercy me, things ain't what they used to be. Radiation underground and in the sky, animals and birds who live are near, nearby are dying. Mercy, mercy me, things ain't what they used to be. What about this overcrowded land? How much more abuse from man can she stand? This was the song in the weary throat of a son, a son killed by his own father, a Pentecostal minister who had a pharisaical approach to parenting, frequently beating his own son from childhood into his teenage years. Marvin Pence Gay Jr. was killed, trying, shot and killed, trying to save his mother from the attacks of his father and still cried out for the blue skies and the oceans and the seas and the animals and the birds and the mother earth. Yes, the songs in Marvin Gaye's weary throat cried out proclaiming, mother, mother, there's too many of you crying. Brother, 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 there's too many of you dying. You know we've got to find a way to bring some loving here today. Father, father, we don't need to escalate. You see, war is not the answer. Only love can conquer hate. Y'all know it's, come on with me. You know we've got to find a way to bring some love in here today. Picket lines and picket signs don't punish me with brutality. Talk to me so you can see what's going on. Yeah, what's going on. What is the song in your weary throat? <clears> throat> What is the song in your weary throat? Pray for me, y'all. I forgot my allergy medicine. <laughs> A sermon for another day. <clears throat> what is the song in your weary throat? As you think through this not so rhetorical question, I must be careful to remind you that this is not just any old song in a weary throat, but rather the song in your weary throat must be one of hope. What is the song of hope? in your weary throat. Many years ago, around 2015, I stood hand zip tied in a makeshift handcuffs by the Baltimore Police Department outside of the courtroom where the second week of pretrial motions carried on for the six police officers who'd handled Freddie Gr Carlos Gray in such a way that led to his death. A friend in the movement, a comrade in the fight for black lives, uh, for black people, to live life and life more abundantly on this side of earth snapped a picture of me that would make its way to social media and eventually onto the Facebook page of a one Alfred Street Baptist church where my mother attended. I don't think she knew I was at this protest. <laughs> and someone on the Facebook page saw that, I should have provided that picture, but they said, who is that young man? Does, she need, does he need help? I had a short haircut at the time. But that spring, April 2015, brought the death, the murder of Freddie Gray. And that summer, July 2015, brought the death, the murder of Sandra Annette Bland. And somehow, I still had hope, a peculiar, dark sense of hope that because Freddie was tossed to and fro, unbuckled in the back of this white police van, his spine and his neck fractured, lapsing into a coma before he gets to the hospital, injuries to his vertebrae and his voice box nearly collapsing, his spine severed almost 80% at his neck, that somehow, because that had happened to Freddie, that I would not suffer the same fate. I had a peculiar, dark sense of hope that because Sandra was found allegedly hung in her jail cell just three days, just 72 hours after being arrested during a racially profiled driven traffic stop, that when I was arrested and placed in my holding cell after my mugshots were taken, that my mother, 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 that my father, 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 that my brother, brother, brother would see me alive. I had hope. Let the church say hope. I had hope, not the audacious sense of hope that was plastered onto posters and best-selling book covers. No, I had the resurrected hope of, of an audacious savior, Mary and Joseph's boy, son of man, God's in flesh martyr, Emmanuel, God with us, who dared sing a song from his weary throat upon an old rugged cross as blood dripped from his body. I had hope. My father is 70 years old now. And a few, year, a few years ago, he said to me that I had hoped that you and your brother wouldn't have to see black people killed in the streets like I did. 
My father, a black man born in 1953, had hoped that things would change for his children, hoped that black people would not continue to be abused and killed in the country, in this country, and now he had grandkids, nieces, and my nephew. Four years ago, when my oldest niece was eight years old, I sat with her on the floor. If we got that picture, that would be great. Helping her to make a collage. She drew herself, a brown-faced little girl, with her curls piled at the top of her head with a pink head headband. Any eight-year-olds, any 12-year-olds in the audience, any young folks there in children's church, amen. <laughs> well, if, if you have an eight-year-old, you know, you understand. So we're sitting on the floor making this collage and you see there's uh, words like, we have more to lose, we stand up, too far, what will we do, how can I help, black is beautiful, <clears throat> uh, the future is what we make it, system, false promise, resilience. And at eight years old, she drew this gun and a bright red line across it and beneath it, the black power fist. And just a few days later, if I can have that next picture, she said, Auntie Ryan, I wanna come with you. My mother, who's also a minister, was hosting a prayer vigil. It was 2020. Uh, George Floyd had been murdered, Sandra, uh, obviously Sandra Bland, um, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey. She said, Auntie Ryan, I wanna come with you to the prayer vigil and, and can I borrow one of your shirts? I have been making these shirts since 2014 and I started with just six names. And then as the time went on, more names were added, including Oscar Grant, Trayvon Martin, Jordan uh, Davis, Eric Garner, Mike Brown, Ezel Ford. I had a list for the sisters as well. Um, and so I let her wear one of my shirts and my nephew's there and that's my brother. And so we go to this prayer vigil She's with me and she's understanding at eight years old that something is wrong, that this world isn't safe for black boys and black girls like her. My father's hope for a world free of anti-black violence would have to remain a hope for future generations. In her chapter, Paranoid Reading and Reparative Reading, or You're So Paranoid You Probably Think This Essay Is About You, <laughs> Eve Sedgwick writes, hope, often a fracturing, even a traumatic thing to experience, is an energy that we can use to try to organize the fragments that we encounter or the fragments that we create. She asserts that because we have room to realize that the future may be different from the present, that it's also possible and necessary, I might add, for us to entertain such profoundly painful or profoundly relieving ethically crucial possibilities that as the past in turn could be different and that our futures could be different. So what are you saying, Pastor? This is not a call for us to ruminate and dwell on the past, but that hope itself could be a byproduct, a symptom of PTSD, post-traumatic spiritual disorientation. Which is to say that hope after disappointment, after discouragement, after funeral, after funeral, after betrayal, after rejection, after devastation, after eviction can be a traumatic thing to experience. You want me to hope? You want me to say God is good all the time and all the time after I've lost my home, after I've lost my job, after I've lost my second child? You want me to hope because that's what good Christians do? Have you ever found a way to hope after disappointment, after discouragement, after betrayal, after rejection, after devastation, all the while asking God, why? Why didn't this work out? Why didn't I get this internship or opportunity? Why did it end in divorce? Why am I still single? Why am I this old and still hurting? Why doesn't therapy seem to be working? Why do I keep getting mistreated? Why don't they see me for this opportunity? Why, God, why? And yet hope imagines a, helps us to imagine a different world. In Psalm 9, the psalmist declares that the hope of the afflicted will never perish. And in Romans 8, Paul tells us that the hope that is seen is not actually hope. 
Hope is the remnant, the thing you kind of got to squint your eyes and look for. Hope is a faint glimmer on the horizon, or as Polly Murray said, hope is a song in a weary throat. I might need some help, Lauren, but hope is a song in a weary throat that cries out after con uh, considering or attempting suicide that sings, oh, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Hope is the song that cries out in a weary throat after 12 hours of a workday getting paid minimum wage that I don't feel no ways tired. Hope is a song that cries out after being denied parole that trouble don't last always. Hope is the song, the voice that cries out after a miscarriage that great is thy faithfulness. Hope is a song in a weary throat that cries out after being talked about, lied on, mistreated that what a friend I have in Jesus. Hope is the song that cries out after not, after not getting into a college, an internship, after losing somebody, that, oh God, Jaira, you are enough. Hope is a song in a weary throat that cries out after your home has been bombed, your house of worship obliterated, your water source contaminated, your chance of dying uh, elevated, your, your chance of dying from disease elevated. Hope is a song in a weary throat that cries out, I told the storm to pass, because storm, you won't last. Hope is a song in a weary throat that cries out after every attack, every affliction, every salt what can man do to me because the Lord is on my side he is among those who help me therefore I will look in triumph on those who hate me hope is a song in a weary throat that refuses to be silent yeah.